Well, hello, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you're enjoying your meal. And what a, what, what a great meal we're being served. Having just had the fish, can't complain about the fish. Although there's been a bit of a complaint at our table that uh, the fish didn't come with fries, like the steak. Is that a common theme? Uh, it's low, a low-carb meal, the fish. Uh, and welcome to the latest instalment uh, of our Sydney Mining Club luncheon series. And as we have seen in recent months, we once again uh, have a packed room and a capacity crowd, which is a testament uh, to the ongoing popularity uh, of these events. So thank you for your attendance and for your support. These events would not be possible without you. Uh, they'd also not be possible without the team at the Sydney Mining Club, who I'd like to briefly acknowledge uh, Will Jeffries, uh, Fanola, Simon and Linda and uh, the other team members that are here today. Thank you to the Sydney Mining Club team for your uh, assistance and work in putting these events together. And of course our sponsors, our wonderful sponsors including our gold sponsors, GBA Capital, Bear Doll Bear. Bear Doll Bear, where's Bear Doll Bear? This, congratulations on 30 years and you might be a few sore heads at the table. After the 30 years celebration at Walsh Bay last night. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Uh, and uh, AME Mineral Economics and our other very kind sponsors, CRE Insurance, the CRU Group, Bender Geographics, Kingsgate Consolidated, Iron Ear, the Research as a Service Group, RFS, RFC Ambrian, Taurus Funds Management, Tease, Veritas Securities, APM Graphics, and if you're wondering why this is on your table, uh, it's not a lucky door prize or an illegal casino. Uh, if you turn it over, you'll see a very clever marketing uh, strategy from Simon. Uh, AMEC and, of course, the New South Wales Minerals Council, thank you to all of our sponsors. Uh, your support makes what we do here possible, so please support our sponsors with your business. Uh, we have two uh, very special speakers uh, as very special guests presenting today on their respective projects here in Australia. Uh, first, we'll be hearing from CEO and Managing Director of Australian Strategic Materials, Rowena Smith. Rowena will be followed by the CEO of VHM Limited, Ron Douglas. Both companies are focused on commodities with the potential to play a special role in the long-term future of mining in Australia, critical minerals and rare earths. I'll leave it to Rowena and Ron to talk in detail about their companies and their projects. And I'll also leave the correct pronunciations of their specific deposits to them too. Uh, titanium is fairly easy to say, uh, as is niobium and zircon, but neodymium and prasidymium are an MC's nightmare. So I'll leave it to the experts in relation to those commodities. Uh, but today's focus on these projects and the minerals they hope to produce, it comes as the New South Wales government finalises an updated critical mineral strategy which is expected to set a strategic direction for the development of our metals and minerals sector into the future. But if th as those of you who were here at our last lunch in June heard me say back then, we need more than a glossy leaflet full of, full of platitudes to make things happen. Uh, as you know, we're blessed with an endowment of riches when it comes to critical minerals and rare earths, but of course we are not the only ones. Uh, we've seen some big funding commitments from governments around the world in relation to critical minerals in particular and from our Commonwealth Government too, although not yet into New South Wales. And the New South Wales Government's own budget is tight, limiting their options. But in the absence of big dollars, some big policy signals are needed to demonstrate the New South Wales Government is serious about the importance of critical minerals for the future. Uh, one thing the New South Wales Government could do, uh, and something we've been calling on them to do, is to flag the potential for state significant infrastructure status for critical minerals projects here in New South Wales. This would enable eligible projects to be assessed through a shorter and less onerous planning process in much the same way the New South Wales Government assesses its, assesses its own projects and some other priority private sector projects in some instances. And as we all know, even relatively modest government funding commitments or equity arrangements can send a strong signal to other potential investors that project risks have been assessed by governments and deemed to be acceptable. 
We also need a change of approach on a range of other policy settings too. It's one thing for politicians and governments to talk up the future of critical minerals and we've heard a lot about that over the last few years and I'm sure their intentions are good and genuine but it's sometimes hard to take it seriously when at the same time uh, those same governments are making it harder for mining projects to get approved more generally through policy changes like the proposed radical broadening of the Commonwealth EPBC Act and here in New South Wales the Biodiversity Conservation Act through the sterilisation of potential exploration prospects by prioritised wind and solar farm developments and through energy policies that risk increased power prices for projects that do manage to get approval and investment. Well, these are just some of the issues we at the New South Wales Minerals Council are focused on in our ongoing engagement with the New South Wales Government. It's not an easy task but we're determined to be strong advocates for the right policies and to convince governments their commitment to critical minerals needs to be about more than just media releases. After the presentations today, both of our guests will be up on stage for a question and answer session, so please enjoy your lunch, enjoy the presentations and get your questions ready. Uh, and on that note, I will now introduce our first speaker, Ms Rowena Smith, CEO and Managing Director of ASM. Rowena, hold your applause. Yeah. <laughs> Are you clapping me or Rowena? Uh, Rowena has over 30 years experience in the mining and minerals processing sector including in a range of senior strategy operations and commercial roles. Prior to joining ASM, Rowena was Chief Sustainability Officer at South32, accountable for sustainability strategy, risk management and health safety and environment business processes. Other past roles include Vice President Supply at South32, General Manager, BHP's Quinana Nickel Refinery and Operational Leadership Roles within Rio Tinto's Aluminium Smelting Business. Rowena joined ASM in July 2021 as Chief Operating Officer, became CEO in July 2022 and was appointed ASM Managing Director in March 2023. Will you please join me in welcoming Rowena to the stage. Right, well thank you very much for this opportunity to share with you the ASM story. I've been looking forward to coming and sharing it with you. There's a lot of talk about critical minerals in Australia, um, but let's talk about critical minerals in New South Wales. And we uh, really pride ourselves on being the premier critical minerals project in this state, so really nice to have this opportunity to talk with the New South Wales um, Mining Club. So, ASM, we are building a rare earths and critical minerals business, a global business, to provide those high-tech metals that are needed to support the clean energy transition. And our strategy is to go from mine all the way through to metals. That starts with our project in Dubbo uh, in New South Wales, we have an advanced project there where once it's in production, we will mine, but we will also do the midstream processing. We will mine it, we will separate it and refine it into a suite of high purity oxide products. And those products can either be exported directly to off-takers into their supply chain, or um, given that that supply chain at the moment really doesn't exist outside of China, uh, we have also made the commitment to providing the next step in the supply chain uh, as an option for our off-takers uh, by taking it through one of our metals plants. The first of our metals plants we've already built, it's already in production in South Korea. And we are making there the neodymium praseodymium metal as well as the specialist alloy, the NDFEB alloy, that is the primary feedstock for the production of those high performance magnets that are an essential component in the electric vehicles, in the wind turbines, and in a lot of the advanced technologies. So the obvious challenge is if we're already in production in South Korea, but we're advanced, but not yet in production in Dubbo, where are we getting our feed from? And the initial feed that we used for commissioning in Korea was feed uh, from China. 
uh, but we've been working with a number of other third party providers to be able to source non-China third party oxide for that facility, both as an interim prior to Dubbo coming online, but also as a permanent supplementary feed so that when Dubbo comes in, then it will support us continuing to expand our metallisation capacity. And indeed, many of the off-takers that we're talking to uh, for off-take with Dubbo are asking us, you know, the, the, the off-takers we're talking to in Korea are very happy for us to expand the facility longer term in, in Ochang in Korea. Um, but the off-takers that we're talking to in other jurisdictions, particularly the States and in Europe, are asking us, can we replicate that facility that we have in Korea in their own jurisdiction, uh, which we certainly can. So um, that's our strategy uh, for ASM. So this is our metals plant. There's just a little video here, just so you get to have a snapshot and look at it, because I have a lot of people ask me, you know, we hear a lot about how this is done in China. It's very dirty uh, and uh, very agricultural. Uh, and I just want to give you that view of, you know, we've got a very, very well-run, clean plant there in South Korea that has um, that we're very proud of. Uh, we built it and uh, commissioned it through the COVID years, which was super challenging. Um, but um, we have been producing that neodymium prosodymium metal, the light rare earth metal, and delivering it to a local Korean customer uh, with regular deliveries since September of 2022. And what we're really focused on here now is the ramp up. So the design capacity of this facility is 3,600 tonne per annum of the alloy material. We have installed capacity here at the moment of 600 tonne per annum, and we are, are just working through the customer validation process to first fill that capacity, and then it's a pretty simple job for us just to replicate units to build out the rest of that capacity up to design. So that's what we're focused on, um, growing that customer base. The customer base uh, that we really want is more for the alloy product. Uh, whilst we can make the metal, and we're making a very uh, good high quality metal um, these days there in that facility, uh, really the, the margin product is the alloy product. And so we're working with the magnet producers. The magnet capacity outside of China is being established it's being established slowly, would be my comment, but it is being established. Uh, and we're working with over half a dozen non-China magnet producers currently either established or emerging, working through that product validation process. But it is quite an involved process. The, um, the magnet producers each have their own IP around their specific specifications that is linked with their specific customers and the products that they're making and what their customer requirements are. You have to do quite the dance just to get into sufficient trust for them to give you the spec so that you can then start the process of demonstrating that you actually can produce it. So it is um, important that you've developed really strong relationships with the magnet producers. Um, and we are 18 months into some of those validation processes now with some of those producers. And in fact, a milestone for us that we announced uh, just a couple of months ago is that now with um, three of those, we're at the final stages where we're, we've given them the commercial size samples, the 500 kilo samples that are the last stage in the testing process in their validation processes prior to being able to start moving into commercial orders. Um, we also um, are working on, uh, in parallel with this, we're working on uh, broadening our product range. We, in addition to having our ops team there in Korea, uh, we have for many years been working uh, with a research group. We were initially in a joint venture with one of the Korean universities, working with them to develop metallization technology and IP to be able to metallize successfully these suite of products. And when ASM was listed, we acquired that JV as a fully owned subsidiary and all the IP and personnel came with it. And that team is now co-located 
in Ochung with our production facility. And we are currently doing the final trials for the dysprosium and the terbium. They are the heavy rare earths as opposed to the lights. Uh, and uh, we're doing the final trials on metallisation of those products and expect to be ready for commercial production next year. So when you're making one of these high performance magnets, the bulk of the material that goes into it is um, the NDFEB alloy, and that is about one third neodymium prosodymium. Uh, the bulk of the rest of it is iron, with then about two to four percent boron, and then there's a s just a sprinkling of uh, their own special recipe products, whether it's dysprosium or terbium. You only need to put in a very small amount of those materials, but it really enhances the performance of the magnet. But each of those, you know, what I call the sprinklings, will be different from customer to customer. Uh, and so for us to be able to have a one-stop shop there where we can metallise in shop all of those elements that are going into that alloy uh, is going to be uh, an important part of our product offering. We also, um, again, just to challenge the, the mythology that this is a dirty business, uh, we made a commitment that we would target being uh, carbon net zero for our operational emissions from commencement of operation in Korea. And we were very happy in our annual report last year to confirm that our first full year of production we delivered on that target. Um, so that is our Korean metals facility, uh, which is where we want the product from Dubbo to go as it then makes its way into the global magnet market, supporting uh, all of those end users. Dubbo is a very unique ore body. When we talk about rare earths, you'll hear a lot about monazites, you'll hear a lot about um, uh, carbonites, you'll ha hear a lot about um, uh, ionic clays. You know, Dubbo is a unique ore body because it is a polymetallic uh, that has the rare earths, it has the neodymium and the praseodymium, it has terbium and dysprosium, but it also has three other minerals that are on the critical minerals lists in most of the Western countries. It has zirconia, it has hafnia, and it has uh, the niobium. And they are traditionally used in super alloys. Um, we uh, see them being used for um, defence applications. We particularly, hafnia uh, is used in the nuclear rods, so we see that used in the nuclear industry. But also increasingly, we are seeing the hafnia particularly being uh, used in the emerging semiconductor technologies. So a lot of growth in those commodities as well as the rare earths. And this is a project that has uh, a long history. We have um, been working on this project for a long time and what it means is it is one of a very small handful of projects globally that are genuinely construction ready and are genuinely able to be in production, providing the materials that the um, industry needs by 2030 uh, to be able to meet the predicted step change in demand. We have got a 20 year life of mine based on the reserve there, but already identified an additional 50 years of resource there uh, for that ore body. So it is a multi-generational project. It crops its surface. It's a sort of a shallow lozenge. So it's a very straightforward um, open pit, you know, more of a quarry really than a, than a mine. And um, really the mining is the least costly and least complicated part of the whole endeavor. The real um, challenge for this project was taking that ore and separating it uh, so that we could uh, make all the discrete pro uh, products because of its polymetallic nature. And so we've been working with Ansto for over 17 years to develop the flow sheet. Over 10 years ago, we invested in a demonstration facility uh, in uh, the, the location there that Ansto have at Lucas Heights. Uh, and this is a comprehensively tested flow sheet. Uh, I would be confident to say it is the most comprehensively tested flow sheet of any rare earth project in Australia. Um, and uh, we've had a lot of government support along the way. 
um, from both state and federal uh, with um, just in the last um, 18 months we've had $17 million in grants that are helping us with this development work. We have got all the approvals, so you know, Stephen mentioned before the challenge for getting your approvals in place. Um, we have the advantage that we've done all that work uh, and um, one of the things that I will often speak to with government is they say, well, what can we do to increase Australia's uh, competitiveness with being able to enter into the critical minerals industry globally? We need to sort out the approvals. There's no doubt they need to sort out the approvals. But if you've got a handful of construction-ready projects that already have their approvals that can't get into production because they can't get funding, then I would argue you need to sort that out first, otherwise all you're doing is bringing up more construction ready projects uh, that are going to be sitting there not producing. So really a lot of the emphasis at the moment for us is on talking with off takers and talking with funders, both um, government funders particularly as well as um, private and uh, commercial uh, sort of off takers to come in and fund this project to get it uh, into reality. Um, just before I move into funding, I just want to talk about some of the work that we're doing on our flow sheet uh, in more recent times because even though we've done a lot of work on this to date, we continue to challenge ourselves on it. There's an enormous pressure uh, on these projects uh, with the capital escalation in the Australian environment at the moment and you know just on that previous slide I didn't touch on it but you know this project's got very strong financials based on the economics that we released in December 21 with over 23 and a half percent internal rate of return uh, and throws out really good cash once it's up and going but it does have a 1.7 billion dollar capex uh, so it is capital intensive to do this midstream processing um, and we're seeing a lot of escalation pressure on that. So we've been continuing to look at what are the ways that we could reduce capital um, to offset some of that. Um, and what we've seen in recent times is some really uh, promising um, developments with our niobium and our hafnia circuits where we've identified ways that we can simplify that flow sheet. We've demonstrated that. We've just released the results yesterday and we are now able to say, yes, we'll be able to reduce the capex and opex of those circuits uh, in the final flow sheet that we go forward with. And we've got an opportunity that we've identified for doing something similar with the rare earths deposit, uh, the rare earth circuit rather. So we'll be working on that in the coming months. But that final work is critical for us in, uh, before we take the step with Bechtel to move into the feasibility study. We've been working with Bechtel for a little while. They've just completed the non-processing infrastructure study work, uh, which has been very helpful. And we awarded earlier this year the um, BFS, the final uh, feasibility work for the um, processing. And what has been an enabler for us is, because I'm sure you would know, you know, we talk about the valley of death in these final steps of trying to get funding to do that final engineering before you actually get into production. Uh, but the US government has been very interested in our project and has given us a letter of interest for up to $32 million to help us fund this last phase of engineering prior to uh, taking FID. So we're just working with USXM in the mo at the moment on finalising that funding arrangement prior to commencing that work with Bechtel, but also doing this work with Ansto in parallel to really make sure that we're optimising uh, that flow sheet before we settle on the scope for that final feasibility work. And one option that can come out of that rare earth options work that we're looking at is if uh, the work that we're doing proves uh, to be correct, then it may give us an opportunity to chunk the project into more than one step. Uh, and that, I'm sure you would appreciate, will be hugely enabling if we can do uh, one product first. It will give us a much lower capital hurdle for the first phase. We can get into revenue generating and then the revenue from project uh, can then help to um, build out the rest of the circuit. Uh, so that is work that we are currently working on there in Dubbo. 
But our intention is to commence that feasibility work um, at the uh, you know, beginning of next year. Uh, that will take us about 12 months, uh, and then that gives us the opportunity to take final investment decision in 2026, and we'll be in production in 28, well ahead of when that really is expected to have that peak um, demand in and around 2030. So, funding. It's a challenge. Uh, US um, government has been an important part of the puzzle for us. Uh, and we've had a lot of support from the federal government. Um, I was participant in the Critical Minerals Roundtable in Washington DC that coincided with the state visit from the Prime Minister and Minister King in October of last year. And what we had there was an opportunity to really understand how US policy could enable a project in Australia. Uh, it's, it wasn't necessarily clear initially. We had to do quite a bit of work to sort it out, but that um, round table uh, definitely helped. Uh, and what we found was that uh, US Exum in particular was very interested in supporting our project on the basis of content. Uh, and we were already working at that point with Bechtel on the non-processing infrastructure. So it was really coming back from that meeting in DC that we sat down with Bechtel and put together the proposal, both for the engineering, final engineering work to be done with um, accessing uh, the um, product that USX can provide for that final bit of engineering, which eventuated in that letter for the 32 million US that I was talking about. But we also put together a proposal with Bechtel for what the execution phase could look like, optimising US content. And on the back of that, the US Exim gave us a letter of interest for $600 million US, which is obviously a very significant statement. And in fact, that's the largest commitment that US Exim have made for any critical minerals project globally, and it is the largest commitment they've made for any project in Australia. So that's exciting. We're enjoying working with them. We're working our way through uh, the, the process with USXM to um, develop the term sheets for those. We also got a letter of interest from the ECA from Canada not long after for $400 million Australian, again, based on content for the um, execution phase. And that joins the letter of support we already had from the EFA for $200 million. So we're feeling very confident at the moment around being able to get the debt part of our funding stacked together. Um, th these are all based on content. We know that we will also be able to access ECAs, particularly in Korea and Europe, on the back of offtake. Uh, so we know that we've got a strong competitive tension in there around building up the debt side. Um, the challenge uh, then continues to be uh, the equity piece of that funding. And so that then, um, again, in the first place, we're really looking to leverage what's available from governments. And, and I think, you know, generally speaking, because these are capital intensive, because you've got a real challenge that you can't just get a project up in isolation because the project can't go anywhere if the rest of the supply chain has not been established simultaneously with it. So in addition to it needing um, some innovation within businesses to think about how they're going to actually fill this supply chain themselves, it also requires us to really think about how we're going to partner with each other across jurisdictions and across supply chains. Uh, but it also requires governments to put in policy to de-risk these investments, to crowd in then the private funding, and it requires governments to think about how they're working across jurisdictions uh, to be able to spread the load as we establish these supply chains. Um, and so it's been really pleasing to see, particularly the federal government has been really active in this place. Um, so, you know, there's the photo of the critical minerals table that I was referencing before. Australia has got funds, the critical minerals facility and the National Reconstruction Fund that have in their mandate to be able to provide equity to these projects as well as debt. And so we're in conversations with both about that. They have it in their mandate, but they've never used it. So as I'm sure you'd appreciate, there's a degree of nervousness about stepping into that. Uh, but, you know, we're uh, advocating very strongly that 
it doesn't have to be large amounts, but as Stephen said earlier, it does send a very strong signal to the rest of the private investors that we are seeking to support this project uh, if the government has um, made a symbolic contribution of equity uh, into the debt. Um, and similarly, in the US, uh, at Christmas, the Department of Defence extended the Title III uh, to include Australia as a domestic source, and that's been a really important development for us. So we're uh, in process now, we've been in regular contact with the Department of Defence over the last eight months, and we're now in process, having submitted white papers uh, in two grant processes um, for what they call non-dilutory equity. But these are um, grants essentially that the Department of Defence uh, will place in at project level uh, into projects that are what they consider to be essential to their supply chain. And interestingly, they are more interested in the zirconia, the hafnia and the niobium than they are the rare earths in this project. Um, so a lot of government to government support is needed to build out these alternative global supply chains as well as um, partnering uh, across the supply chain company to company as well as a lot of innovation uh, within the businesses to work through the challenges of developing their flow sheets uh, and getting these uh, into production. ASM, uh, we're well progressed. We're already producing the high-tech metals in Korea. We're construction ready and really working hard on our funding deck uh, for uh, Dubbo. We have got very strong support from government, not just here, but in Korea and in the US as well. Uh, and uh, I will look forward to being able to come back at some point in the future, celebrating our taking fun financial investment decision. Thanks very much, everybody. Uh, thank you very much, Rowena, and uh, we'll have a chance to ask some questions of Rowena a little later on, so, so I'm sure there'll be plenty of interest in that too. Um, before I introduce our next speaker, um, just an update on our founder, uh, Julian Malnick, who I know many of you know very well. Uh, some of you may be aware that uh, he's currently recovering from surgery in Brisbane. Uh, he has had a knee replacement last Friday. Uh, I don't know if anyone in the room has had a knee replacement before, uh, but judging from the pictures he's sent me, it does look like a very painful process. And judging from the messages he's been sending myself and Will, he's clearly on a lot of painkillers. <laughs> <laughs> he's recovering well, I'm told. But what I thought would be nice to do, with your indulgence, would be to, to get a selfie of myself on stage with uh, the room giving Julian the thumbs up for a speedy recovery. If you wouldn't mind doing that, I think it would be a lovely gesture that he'd will appreciate. So can I ask you all to give a big thumbs up and I'll send it to him. When I sit down, he'll love it. <laughs> we'll never hear the end of it, so. <clears throat> okay, on to our next speaker, Mr. Ron Douglas of v from VHM Limited. Uh, Ron has extensive experience across a range of executive and operations roles over 40 years within publicly listed global mining, energy and manufacturing companies. He has been responsible for multiple major projects in mining and engineering and construction companies and is highly experienced in international operations and compliance knowledge, having lived and worked in the Americas, West Africa, the United Kingdom, the Netherlands and Australasia. So you must have gone through a few passports there, Ron. Uh, he's held several board positions for publicly listed companies, was appointed non-executive director to the VHM board in August 2023, and assumed the role of CEO in February 2024. Will you please join me in welcoming Ron to the stage? Thank you very much and great to be here. Um, I passed the first challenge of actually finding the room. I had to go up this little alleyway, but, and I've left breadcrumbs so I can, uh, I can return from where I came. Um, 
My story is completely different to Rowena's in that um, we're upstream. And in fact, Rowena and I have been in discussions with respect to product going to the wonderful Dubbo um, uh, development that she's just spoken about. So this is more the classic Australian mining, which is dig it up and concentrate it and uh, move it out. So without further to do, so this is us, VHM. Um, East Coast, this is the whole basis of this discussion today. Um, we're in the great state of Victoria. Um, and uh, yes, the great state of Victoria. Um, we, have, um, we have some great assets in the uh, Murray Basin, um, nearest town, Swan Hill. Uh, our uh, tenements, well, in fact, our mineralisation extends over um, 55 kilometres, so it's, uh, it's a massive resource and, in fact, um, can create a huge new industry for Victoria. Uh, whilst all the original sandstone buildings were built on the back of gold, there's a great opportunity to um, sort out the debt on the back of rare earths and mineral sands. Um, we took... Uh, you're going to hear me talk about the Gosham project. We selected, rather than try and find, you know, the perfect project. We just picked one that worked really well and we took that forward to permitting. And um, further to the earlier comments that made, um, permitting remains an issue in this country and it's, um, it is my biggest hurdle. So who are we? New miner in the Murray Basin. And I'm using new miner now because um, we're going to be in production at the end of 2025. Um, we're construction ready, albeit, with the caveat, a permit about to arrive. Um, we also, uh, unlike uh, the complexity of creating metals, we're very simple. Um, this mineralisation was the result of the erosion of the Boga granite, granites in um, the Mali region. And so, essentially, they were, um, the mineralisation occurs in lenses within a sand setting, so at the uh, the wash zone, uh, as the inland sea came up against the granites, it actually concentrated, so you see all the strand lines, which are actually the rare earths where they concentrated. Um, it comes to near surface, six metres in sand, so I'd call that market gardening rather than mining, but um, we do call it mining. Um, dual commodities, and that's really important, and you'll hear that in a minute, in that um, it's both mineral sands and rare earths. Um, and um, as Rowena spoke to, we have a compelling um, mineral assemblage, and I have a slide on that as well, so I won't spend much time on it here. Advanced approvals. I've got a slide on that. And we own the land as well, so um, uh, we went and acquired the land we needed to mine for the first 20 years. Um, and once again, it's multi-generational. It will be there for a long time. So, and uh, this is a key part of the story the Goldilocks price. Um, and I'm talking about rare earths here, and if um, I think anyone that's been in this business as long as I and got as grey hair as I have will know that whenever you see a price go up, suddenly it is going to return suddenly. Um, you need to actually use the regress to the mean as a way of predicting future prices. Um, and in fact, as you can see in 2021, the price of the rare earth um, uh, used NDPR as the, um, the, the, the value, um, started to move very dramatically. Um, and the, the, the big supplier, the gorilla in the room, being China, and China is that gorilla because the Western nations didn't want to, uh, were in exporting their environmental issues to China. Um, and a lot of the southern China um, rare earths are actually in situ leaching. And so it's actually doing um, grave damage to the environment. Um, and as Rowena said, it is possible to do a, a different way, but that is currently the West exporting um, their issues to the East. And they have done very well. If you look at the, the last 30 years, um, all the patents and the IP in this industry are actually 70% by Chinese. And now they have reached a position, and this is why uh, there is this rush by Western governments to come up with 
alternate supply paths and new, um, because the East have now said, we are not going to export that IP to others. You are now 30 years behind. This is a strategic um, minerals to us and we're gonna keep them strategic. And there's more to that. And so th the markets come back. So right now, if you look at my, um, my financials, I'm a mineral sands producer um, rather than the rare earth producer. And so that is about where we are. The challenge at this moment in time is the fact that China immediately responded when the prices went up. The Goldilocks position for them is just an, at the price where they're making money from their manufacturing, but they're stopping new entry. That's what it's about. However, anyone who thinks that the price is gonna continue up on the peak that you see there, um, it's a bit like lithium at this moment in time as well. It is not sustainable. Anyway, let's go on. So what do we do? Um, as I mentioned, we have um, both the lights, and you heard Rowena speak to that, and the heavies, DYTV, and they're pretty important. And then the mineral sands. And without those, that dual revenue stream, um, I wouldn't be talking about starting a project. And I can do it because I do have the dual revenue stream. Um, simple process, come out of the ground, get started, and the upside is the rare earths, because um, they will trend up driven by the physicals. And what I mean by that is every day you see in the marketplace more EVs, more turbines, and, and you know, monthly or quarterly there may be a, uh, a slowdown as people move to hybrids because of some reason, but the reality is the thematic of decarbonisation is occurring. It will keep going. And we have things that are important. So the great East Coast rare earth, we have an absolute powerhouse down in Victoria which can feed to Dubbo of rare earths um, with the heavies in it which are not available in most deposits of rare earths and they're critical to defence, US defence for instance, and to I'm going to say uh, the US requires an awful lot of disposium for its nuclear submarines and its fighters. So it finds it pretty critical that other nations start producing this and they don't rely just on um, China. So it's very important. There's a whole lot of it down the Murray Basin and it should be a reason for us to power this forward. You know that we, we talk about electric vehicles, wind turbines, etc. But at the end of the day, rare earths go into these things, everything we do. So as we move forward into um, the future and our children's future, I would say you need rare earths. Right now, there isn't substitution. And here's the here's the bid on the um, on the heavies, and it's mentioned a bit by the the special um, formulas that Rowena spoke about. Um, Standard, you know, um, NDFE magnets, um, they've got a limited range, sprinkle a little bit of disposium and turbine into them and they're super class. And that's why they're necessary for defence and heat. And if you want to shrink things down and be more efficient, I'd say go to the top of the range and they're the heavies. And so they're really important and uh, we can create a whole industry on the east coast if we just focus on this and help us move forward. And the other side, and so there are the rare, rare earths, the other side of the things that we do is the um, zircon and titania, and I say, that's about urbanisation. It's tiles, it's paints, it's all that. Um, and there's 1.4 billion Indians and still 200 billion Chinese and, you know, billion Africans. They all want to live like us. And so as long as that's occurring, there's going to be growth. So good second revenue stream, or at this very moment in time with the depressed rare earths, good first revenue stream. And I say the markers are driven by physicals, and that is because every more and more EVs, more and more turbines, it will overrun the pressure that the Chinese have put on the prices at this moment in time. Supply and demand will always work. Assume the spikes are gone. It will have a long-term growth, 
and it will regress to the mean. So you'll see it just steadily trend up. Do not make an investment on a high point. And this is us. This is the 5 million tonne per annum process plant with um, going to carbonate. You know, Rowena wants our product. So we're, we're joined at the hips in some way. Um, the, uh, but as I said, we're looking at something smaller than that and going to bootstrap our way up because that I've got to deal with the market I have and with the, um, with the balance sheet that I have. And so we've found a pathway forward. So as we accelerate to production, what are we doing? We have completed our feasibility studies. We have a detailed design. We went to permitting, and I'm going to slow show that slide in a minute. Um, we have an offtake with Shenghai, which is a very large Chinese offtaker. And uh, how did the Australian government feel about that? As long as they don't enter our register and buy our shares, a commercial transaction is perfectly fine, because. I can't go ahead unless I can sell the product and they are stepping up to support us. They are. Um, we've looked at, we've now entered into a agreement with an engineering company and a mining company. The mining company is a local Bendigo based uh, mining company. They're doing the mining just 100 k's up the road, identical. So we have absolute clarity on how we're going to do this and how it's going to go ahead. And now I'm going to get to the tricky bit. The one thing that remains is the final permit. And the final permit is the major permit. Let me explain the Victorian system for you. We spent two years um, with the government departments um, taking them through how we're going to de develop and operate this facility such that it meets all their requirements. After two years, um, the planning minister said we could go to the public and have a public um, display. And then there was a panel for, uh, of, with three elected panel members that sat for five weeks, which we paid for as well. Um, and during that panel, I must admit, I was called a few names by farmers. Um, however, it has been completed and it has gone back to the minister um, for her signature, having signed it once. And I'm sitting here and, and I do believe in circa 30 days, I'm there. Um, they have followed the process very well. I go to the Treasurer and I go to the Resource Minister and they're my best friends. However, um, the Planning Minister is the person with the pen that has my future in her hands. Um, so I'm, I have a, a pretty good confidence level. However, it is government. And so I'm not going to put my card from my table and bet that. So. Uh, Confident, but wary. And this is us. First, uh, doing the final work now. We've got to do some work with um, plans and etc. First quarter next year, FID, final investment decision. The board will have considered that risks have been put at such a level that they're comfortable that we can deliver on this and make money. Um, and then I'm out to market and we're away. And then you better have your plant ready by, um, by December of 2025 because I've got product. <laughs> and this is, this is this, uh, you can't have a mining slide without a cross section and something mentioned on it or a few rocks. So here it is. Um, our mineral um, resource is, is huge. Um, the reserve is 200. We stopped like there, it's just gonna keep on going. The, um, where we are from Gosham, if you go to Area 4, it's at 6 metres, it, it comes out at 2 metres. You've got these high grades, um, they're all, all cut off by roads and that because we don't want to upset um, anyone. Um, but it is, it is a great asset, it should power Victoria and solve a lot of their debts. Um, and there's not only us, it actually, the whole Murray Basin runs down to the, you know, Astron project, etc. This is an opportunity for Victoria to actually be a world leader in those metals that are needed for our kids' future. They just have to grasp it and give us support. And Rowena spoke to this, so I'm going to spend no time on it whatsoever. Everyone is trying to find the alternate um, supply chains. It's important we do it as ecosystems. So I work with Rowena. 
I work with Aluka. They've got a whole pile of taxpayers' money to do the Iniaba refinery. Um, Linus is doing a refinery in Kalgoorlie. We don't all have to get to metal. We just have to work together. And governments have to see it that way as well. How do we help each other? This industry is hard enough as it is um, if we don't work together. So, and everyone's interested. It's a matter of what is necessary to actually get to the outcome you're after. And our outcome is simple. It's a mine concentrating to a rare earth and a mineral sands concentrate, simple products that everyone can take. I'll let the, um, the smarter stuff of turning into metal to smarter people than me, like Rowena and her team. I'll just do the, uh, the stuff at the other end. And so what's coming up? Well, of course, the next thing is the planning permit given. And so everyone cross your fingers and wish me well and um, write to the local minister. Um, and then it is just the standard process going through and production. I hope to be here in a hard hat next year because I'm building something. So thank you very much, everyone. I really appreciate your time. and. Uh, <laughs> Go away, Ron. Um, I'm sorry that dessert's just been served. Uh, I'm sure they'll keep it on the table for you. But we now have our question and answer session with our two guests. So, uh, Romina, if you'd be kind enough to join us on the stage. Uh, we have 15 minutes for questions, and I'm sure we'll have plenty. So if you could keep your questions relative, relatively brief for the consideration of others, that would be very much appreciated too. Um, just an update, I did receive a response from Julian to my photo. It involves several emojis. Uh, so clearly he's still on those painkillers. Uh, but uh, there's a love heart there, so I think that he appreciated the gesture, which is very nice. So thank you to everybody for that. Okay, uh, I, if I could just ask one question just to, just to kick off. Uh, in relation to the whole critical minerals and and rare earths narrative that we've seen develop over the last several years or so from governments. Um, much has spoken about the renewable energy side of things and, and demand for renewable energy. Um, less is spoken uh, particularly by, by politicians about the defence and national security and uh, geostrategic implications of it, although both of you touched on that in your presentations. Uh, from your experience working in the industry and with governments, in the conversations that you're having with them without giving away any national security secrets or any, any issues there. Um, what, what percentage of those discussions do you find are on renewable energy and what percentage are related to defence and national security issues? Well, I think they are almost entirely around economic security and I think my comment would be that there's a general recognition that um, there are there are defence implications for not having a strong economy. So those two things are not mutually exclusive. Um, and if we have ourselves at a point where where there's some sort of geopolitical tension and the retaliation for that is to cut off the supply chain, as has been seen already in some uh, examples of it, then that has an immediate impact on the economies of um, those countries. So that's, I think, the primary scenario uh, where people are, are really focused. And then, um, and then there's a sort of a secondary discussion around, yes, and then they also need to know that they've got the critical materials for their military equipment. Um, and so that, if you're talking to Department of Defence, obviously that's their whole, uh, well even then, it's not actually their whole focus because they actually have two programs. The primary one is around their equipment, but the second one, even the Department of Defence have got funding to put towards the economic security uh, because they understand how essential it is. Uh, and I support that and in, uh, in fact I had a Com well, the Department of Defence has invested in um, Canadian assets to ensure that um, this ecosystem and supply chain is put in place. Um, I had a call with a, um, essentially you'd call it an intermediary that was working on behalf of the Department of Defence to look at 
how uh, and it's just sort of, they're just trying to find these alternate pathways to make sure um, because history has shown that um, China can often take action and if they take action in these strategic metals then uh, that would be devastating to um, the defence industry. <coughs> Thank you. Okay, uh, we have some questions from the floor. Linda has a has a microphone. If you have a question, if you could please raise your hand. We have two microphones. No questions. I'm so we stunned. obviously did a very good job of explaining things. You must have. Yeah, we want an early mark. No one has to pronounce the metal. <laughs> uh, Brian, Brian from Tate Metals. We're in the same industry. I, I'm curious about the. Uh, ex-import support that the various governments uh, are providing. Maybe you can talk about um, how that's supporting the debt capital component of your projects um, and um, what are the conditions around, you know, utilising those facilities? Well, I can certainly talk to US Exim. So if we're talking about the ECAs, they're, they're different. Different jurisdictions focus in different ways. So the US and the Canadians focus on content specifically, um, whereas the Koreans and the Europeans are more interested in whether offtake is coming into their jurisdiction. Um, and the only real um, focus that US has around offtake is that it doesn't go to China, so that will be a prerequisite to access US funding. Um, Canada um, is much more interested in uh, ensuring that it meets ESG requirements, so that would be sort of the primary um, co-commitment. Um, so it is interesting how they do differ. Uh, if you're talking then about some of the um, the the tariffs and those sorts of policies that they're developing, there are an increasing um, number of policies, particularly in the states, that are requiring for the electric vehicles, for instance, that if you want to get a certain tax rebates, then you have to have a non-China car. The whole vehicle has to be sourced from non-China product. And it started with just the batteries, and then they sort of started to say, you know, a few more, and now they're at the point, if you want the full rebates, then you have to demonstrate provenance to be able to show that you've sourced it from a non-China supply chain. And, and the government's doing that because they're wanting to provide um, volume to make sure that the alternative supply industry or the supply chain is actually economic so that when they need it for defence purposes, which is a much smaller volume, it actually exists. The, uh, and in fact, it's sort of bifurcated and if you go back 10 years um, and that's why you see um, the, the two streams um, the export finance groups supported their local industry and whether that was consulting or equipment supply so they provided essentially debt into a project for you to use their consultants uh, their equipment so in fact it was a national interest test which has now been changed by still a national interest test, but um, around specific metals, and if you do this, then we're going to support you. So, and that probably ramped up, you know, five years ago, it ramped up really high. Before then, it was just national interest. Use our engineers, use our equipment, and we'll give you cash. The cash comes usually at the same tenor of the commercial banks, so they, they tuck in behind the commercial banks, but they come with, um, uh, they give you the insurances and that, which gives the market comfort that you can develop and you're not going to run out. So um, it was all that, and now it's been um, confused a bit by this more strategic investment. Okay. Oh. I was beginning to worry about the guys from Bear Do Bear and I thought I was thinking you must have had one hell of a party last night if we don't get a question from that table. Well, thank you for that great introduction. <laughs> That's a question for Rowena. Given that your ore reserves haven't changed since 2017 and uh, costs have in increased significantly and also prices have more than halved, do you intend to update your ore reserves? in the near future. Thank you. 
Yeah, we will update the economics on the project um, when we have done the bankable feasibility study because we need to update, as I said before, what the final flow sheet is. Uh, that will impact on the economics of the project um, and um, as well as the pricing. But the pricing deck is transparent, what the pricing assumptions are. And the long-term price assumption for Hafnia, for example, uh, is $1,000 US per kilo. Current spot price is $4,700. Uh, the long-term um, price that we've assumed for the neodymium praseodymium is 104. That's above what the current spot price is, uh, but pretty close to where those long-term lines were on Ron's graph earlier on, and certainly a lot lower than what we uh, are seeing with some of our peers who predominantly the projects that have been put out in public domain recently are using 133 uh, as their long-term price assumption. Um, so we're not uh, at that high. So we know that when we update um, the pack, we'll be updating uh, the FX assumptions as well, which will uh, more than likely go in our favour. So there are things that are going to go for the project, there are things that are going to go against, uh, and we will do that update once uh, when we finalise the engineering work. A question for Ron. What proportion of your resources, um, the value of your resources, is locked up in the rare earths as opposed to the other more traditional heavy minerals like zirconium and uh, titanium? Um, if you take the rare earth numbers back to those long-term numbers, around about 100, um, the revenue stream is 72% um, rare earths and the rest uh, heavy minerals at this red hot moment with the prices where they are just uh, um, I'm using wood Mac numbers not um, spot so it's just above spot um, and then uh, the heavy minerals are 64 percent of the revenue stream and the rare earth so it swung you know from 70 down to a 30 something um, it's quite considerable so there's a real um, opportunity um, heading off with a dual stream for the because um, the physicals will win if you keep on decarbonizing at some point they'll overpower the uh, what's happening with the uh, um, so the demand will overcome the supply um, and move the prices and and put them in the right spot um, and that's a real uh, you know arbitrage on where we are at this moment in time uh, question down the front Ron, I'm just wondering if you can explain the difference in approach between VHM and Astron, your neighbour. Astron's obviously uh, producing monazide and that's going to be sold to energy fuels, the White Mesa Mill in Utah, whilst you're producing rare earth carbonates. Um, that's a significant difference in approach. The, um, the, the way I intend to come out of the blocks is actually just do phase one, which is the rare earth concentrate and the heavy minerals. So. Um, the option is there to go to a carbonate. However, uh, we, we really need to think about, as, a, as an Australian industry, uh, is it not better served to go to Dubbo, to go to Eniaba, to go to Linus, rather than... Uh, so I don't see... Because whilst it adds quite a considerable revenue to take it to the carbonate stream, um, providing I get fair value putting it somewhere else where they've put the capital in, uh, why would I do that? One last question. Uh, do you see the result of the uh, US election in November affecting any of these uh, plans you have for the future? It's been interesting. It's a question I've certainly <laughs> been asking a lot. Um, I've spent a lot of time in DC in the last six months um, and um, been talking about it a lot. I think. Um, if we were looking for getting funding from the DOE or if we were uh, dependent on some sort of extension of the Inflation Reduction Act, I'd be concerned. Uh, but we, you know, the Inflation Reduction Act really doesn't impact on us because that's really about batteries and we're magnets. Um, and, you know, the USXM are very uh, clear that their policy is, has got bipartisan support. And similarly, Department of Defence... Uh, is also, um, you know, 
fairly um, indifferent to which government is in, and in fact, if Trump gets in, uh, it's possible that actually it'll be stronger. Uh, so we're not overly concerned about that at the moment. Oh, look, I'd echo that as well. I think that um, the, the world has become far more complex and um, as each nation sort of looks out for itself, so the, um, in some ways we're starting to act a bit more like China. <laughs> and um, the, uh, and that, that causes nations to actually try and get their own uh, supply sources and uh, I don't, it's opportunity as much as anything else. So um, I don't see it material to our projects going forward or not. Will you please thank our guests uh, for their wonderful presentations uh, and their very willing answers to your questions. And before you leave the stage, uh, regular attendees at these lunches will know uh, of our tradition of giving gifts to our speakers. And again, uh, we have a gift for our speakers. Uh, it's the Southern Cross flag of the Ballarat Reform League. It may be a little bit more relevant for you, Ron, given your proximity uh, to where this flag <laughs> first flew. As uh, those of you who have been here before know, it was first flown on the 29th of November 1854 at Bakery Hill. This was the third mass meeting of the Ballarat Reform League, which had been formed on the 11th of November at a similar gathering. There was one before that that got a bit out of hand and a hotel got burnt down, but we'll gloss over that for now. Uh, on the 29th of November, uh, the 10,000 miners gathered again and they agreed to, uh, that they would send a petition to Governor Hotham and uh, Governor Hotham uh, heard that deputation uh, and the demands of the deputation included the release of the three men that had been convicted for the arson on the hotel in the eyes of the miners unfairly. Uh, on the 29th of November at that meeting uh, word came back to the 10,000 or, 10, or so miners that the Governor had refused uh, their demands and their, the deputation's requests. He'd made a number of other concessions including a possible inquiry, but he refused their key request. And the 10,000 miners raised this flag, swore their allegiance, burned their mining licences. Ron, I would suggest probably not a good idea if you <laughs> get your mining licence in a month. So don't burn it in protest in front of Parliament in Victoria. Uh, and, 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 and four days later, on the morning of the 4th of December, this was the flag that flew uh, during that famous battle that raged as the musket balled hit as the rattle of, of gunfire as men were screaming in agony uh, as the redcoats stormed in and took the stockade and made that arrest, those arrests and, and, and that action of that famous day. So the flag has got a bad rap from time to time. I think we may be getting it back from the CFMEU though. <laughs> what do you think? Uh, we're getting closer. We're getting closer. Uh, and, and, and at its essence, it's a symbol of unity and solidarity against perceived government overreach and oppression. Uh, from an industry that does so much for this country and is under so much scrutiny and often under significant attack. It's a flag that, at its essence, is a miner's flag. And as Julian likes to say, it's our flag. We should fly it proudly. And uh, we present it to you in that very spirit. It's amazing what you can find on Wikipedia, Ron. <laughs> becoming an expert. Oh, we will wrap it up. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks very much for your attendance today uh, and, and thanks again to our guest speakers uh, for their very interesting presentations on uh, some very topical matters. Uh, we have uh, a number of events planned before the end of the year and they're all going to be very exciting as well. Our next Leading Edge event on Thursday the 5th of September, we are focusing on tin, Tasmanian tin. Uh, Metals X, the Executive Director Brett Smith will be talking about their renaissance operation in Tasmania. They are Australia's, Australia's largest tin producer and will have stellar resources. Executive Director and CEO Simon Taylor, their proposed Heemskirk tin project in northern Tasmania as well. So uh, if, you're in, if you're into tin, be at the next Leading Edge event on Thursday the 5th of September, don't miss it. Our next lunch event on Thursday the 3rd of October, we'll be focusing on, on, on copper again. We'll have Chalice Mining Manager, Managing Director and CEO Alex Dorsch talking about their Gonneville resource in WA. Uh, and we'll have Polar X Managing Director, Jason Burton, who I believe will be focusing on two projects in Alaska, the very Alaskan named Caribou Dome Project and the Stellar Project in Alaska. So those two events are coming up. You'll get the notifications on, on your email. Uh, please get in early and get your tickets 
before they are sold out because, as I said at the outset, our events are very popular. Uh, we love to see you there, but we don't want you to miss out. Thanks again for your attendance. Please enjoy the rest of the afternoon.